Hello everyone, my name is Emmanuel O'Hayan, I'm a software engineer here at CoronaSafe and today's topic will be real-time safety critical systems and we'll see how you can go multi-core hopefully almost without breaking a sweat. So let's get started. So first things first, who are we? Uh, CoronaSafe is a software company founded in 2011. We are roughly 50 employees, most of us are based in Orsay in France, 20 kilometers or so south of Paris, and uh, obviously we are targeting the embedded safety critical systems market. We are offering a technology called Asterios. Uh, Asterios is a set of tools to help you design, build, test and ultimately execute safety critical real-time software. And when I say execute, I mean execute on the actual hardware, on the final target, but more on that later. Uh, the technology behind Astaios is actually based on an older technology once developed by the CEA, the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, back then the technology was called OASIS, and it is still currently used by Framatum in their last generation of nuclear power plant. So the roots of Asterios, uh, as you can see, are rather bulletproof when it comes to safety. Um, the main markets, however, targeted by Kronosafe are aerospace, automotive and railway. And currently our efforts are focused on achieving the highest level of certification for airborne applicative software. That's a um, dull A level for a DO178C. Getting to the heart of our subject for today, what is the problem with multicore processors? Well, there are obvious pros for these architectures, none of which should be a surprise. Um, increased computation power, reduced cost, power efficiency, etc., etc. But most importantly, there is no way getting around them today, as most, if not all, of embedded platforms produced today are multi-core platforms. So at some point we have to do something about it, whether we like it or not. Um, well, also, they, the fact is they come with well-known issues also that uh, we've been trying to address for decades now. All these issues are related to the fact that multicore architectures imply simultaneous execution and thus resource sharing. Uh, the resource may be software, like a memory, a memory lock, a semaphore, for example, or hardware, a memory bus, an I.O. device, etc., a memory cache. And one thing worth noticing is that the issue is even these issues are even harder for us real-time systems developers. Assuming you've managed to build the perfect, correct application, no bug, no starvation, no, ra no, no race condition whatsoever, you will still observe hardware interferences that will cause execution time variations, typically uh, congestion on a shared memory bus or cache pollution. Those are very common phenomenon. And obviously real-time people do not like execution time variations even more when they are inherently difficult to predict and bound. So <clears throat> um, the specific issues raised by multicore architecture are listed in a so-called position paper that is emitted by aviation certification authorities. This paper is called CAS 32A and it's freely available on the internet. Uh, you have the reference here. And at the end of this talk, we'll come back to that position paper and we'll show how the solution we offer with Asterius uh, addresses most, if not all, the topics listed in that document. So more on that later. Now, before showing you how we claim solving MCP-related issues, MCP is standing for multicore processors, um, there's something really important that we need to point out. If you've been working with multitask real-time systems, and most systems are multitask today, then those resource-sharing issues should be old news for you, really. All those problems, starvation, deadlocks, uh, execution time variation due to hardware interference, these problems can be observed on single-core multitask systems, as the concept of a task in itself is actually a way to share a resource, the CPU, between several entities, the tasks. And don't get me wrong here, obviously resource sharing problems and execution time variation problems are way more acute on multicore platforms. What I just mean is, We've been emulating simultaneous execution since we invented the concept, the, the concept of a task on single-core CPUs. Switching to actual multi-core platforms just increases, and sometimes it increases drastically, the chances of observing these kind of bugs. 
If you're not convinced yet, there's a nice example that I particularly like to make my point. Uh, one that comes from perhaps the very first embedded real-time computing system in the history of engineering. Uh, on the 20th of July 1969, the Apollo 11 mission is about to attempt the first lunar landing, and minutes before that landing, the uh, embedded computer reports an error coming with a very stressful, very loud uh, alarm ring, and the display uh, simply says uh, error 1202. And by the way, that's also the start of a very long, still ongoing history of incomprehensible error codes reported by computers, but that's for another subject. Uh, it was found later that this 1202 alarm was due to a storm of interrupts uh, received by the processor, and the, these interrupts required the execution of more tasks that, that was expected during the tests that were made on Earth. These tasks starved other tasks by using more CPU time than expected, and this alarm simply reported that the computer decided to drop some tasks uh, to only focus on uh, guidance, navigation, and control, the main mission of this computer, thus allowing, uh, in the end, the spacecraft to land on the moon successfully. So there you have it. It's a typical software-software interference. Somehow, the execution time of a task has changed, and it has starved another task that was supposed to run next to it, or uh, at the same time, in parallel. And needless to say, the Apollo Guidance Computer, that was the name of this, uh, this system, the AGC, it had a single core processor. So that's the working hypothesis that Astaios was built upon. We believe that these issues that we observe today with multi-core processors already existed with preemptive signal core systems. They were subject to software and hardware interferences as well. And thus, we didn't solve these problems, we only coped with them. The problem is actually more global, thus it, needs, it requires a global approach to be solved. And that's really the topic of this talk. Uh, I am going to introduce a complete real-time programming model and uh, we'll see how it naturally addresses the issues uh, that we consider uh, specific to multi-core architectures. As a matter of fact, what I do hope is at, that at the end of this talk, you will see that the, these problems are actually naturally addressed by the programming model. They will be naturally resolved. Uh, I won't focus specifically on them, I will focus on the programming model and you'll see in the end that, well, all these problems are simply just gone. Okay, before I show you this programming model, let's take a very simple, even simplistic example um, and we'll see how we can quickly turn it into a nightmare. It should ring a bell if you're a system integrator, really. So consider we have a system with a single periodic task that you want to implement on a single core architecture. The, so the task is periodic. The first timeline shows you the um, expected behavior of the task. The second timeline shows you the scheduling table. Assume you have to do the scheduling manually. And so, so far everything looks well. There's only one task to execute. The scheduling table are quite straightforward. So everything is good and then of course the system will evaluate and at some point we need to add another task. So assume that task is also periodic but twice slower than task number one and also since we have two tasks usually we need them to communicate so assume that task two reads data produced by task one. Okay, so now what uh, do the scheduling tables look like? Well, because of the execution time required by task 2, uh, we now need to introduce preemption. As you can see, task 2 does not have enough time to be executed within the first time slot, so it is preempted on this tick uh, to allow task 1 to be executed for its second instance, and then task 2 can be restored and its execution, the execution of the first instance of task 2 can be completed. But communication between task 1 and task 2 also requires to uh, wonder about task synchronization because we need to know uh, which data is supposed to be visible to task 2. Uh, does the data read by task 2 needs to be the one produced during the first instance of task 1 or the second instance of task 1? Obviously, uh, this choice will have consequences on the scheduling. Uh, besides, we need to wonder also, is task 2 allowed to read data produced by task 1? 
while it is actually being written by task one because because of this preemption it, it is possible that task two is reading the dat data while it is being written by task one that raises uh, concerns on system reproducibility because the data read, read by task two can be inconsistent and well that's a lot of issues for a simple system with two periodic harmonic tasks but okay it's still tractable but of course, because there is still some CPU time available, at some point your system will evolve yet again. You will need to add a third task, call it task zero, and say it's twice faster as task one. And for the sake of simplicity, let's say that it does not even need to communicate with neither task one or task two. Okay, It's just, say, a monitoring task. Well, despite the fact that it does not communicate with the rest of the system, introducing task zero will, well, first of all, it will require the system integrator to reshuffle the scheduling tables. Now task two is preempted not once, but twice over each instance. That may raise new race conditions uh, regarding the data being exchanged with task one. And that means that introducing a task that does not communicate with the system, task zero, it does not communicate with task one nor task two, and yet it has consequences on the observable behavior of task one and task two. That's just unacceptable. That makes the problem untractable. Now you probably get the idea that nightmare becomes darker and darker as you add layers of specifications. Um, you may consider that adding task zero has consequences on the execution time of task two. For instance, we've seen that now it is preempted twice for each instance instead of once. So obviously it's possible that it requires more CPU time to complete. Uh, so you need to reshuffle your scheduling tables. Uh, consider what will happen if you want to change even slightly the temporal behavior of task one. You need to reshuffle your scheduling tables all over again. And of course, if you add yet another task to the system, well, that the nightmare becomes complete and your system integrator will probably resign the day you will ask to go multi-core because you need to benefit from more computing power. So, so what went wrong in this example? Well, what went wrong is that we've tried to address simultaneously different issues that were tightly coupled uh, as we added layers of specification on top of our system. And there are mainly four types of concerns that we've tried to address. The first kind of concern is software architecture. Uh, we, how many tasks do we need? Which tasks do we need? And uh, how are they supposed to communicate? Basic software architecture. Then there's temporal architecture. What is the temporal behavior for each of these tasks? In that case, because we had periodic tasks, that's just setting the task activation frequency. And also we have to wonder how many CPU time must be granted to each task to ensure that they complete in time, in real time. The third problem is scheduling. We need to, we need, every time we had an evolution, we had to reshuffle the scheduling table. We had to rewrite the scheduling table manually. And that includes, of course, allocation of each task on core when we have a multi-core architecture. And the last thing we had to, uh, to worry about was communication. We need to ensure that we have a communication paradigm that ensures data consistency and that also ensures reproducibility and determinism. These are key properties for uh, safetyness, but we'll come back on that later. And I want you to know that when, in this simple example, when we had to change any of these four parameters, the other ones had to change accordingly. And we had to deal with all these four parameters simultaneously. That was its intractable. Obviously, we need a tool to enable us to change one single parameter and the other one must be changed automatically by the tool for us. That's exactly what we intend to do with Asterios. So what is Asterios? Um, first of all, it's a real-time programming model. So it's an abstraction. Uh, that's the first layer of Asterios somehow. Uh, the, the programming model uh, that we provide, we call it Psi. It's a multitask programming model, meaning you can define several tasks. One task, in the usual sense of the word, it's a sequential execution unit, meaning it's 
basically a set of instructions to be executed one after the other and all the tasks can be executed in parallel in this model so the, the model doesn't care if you're running the tasks in parallel or if you have a preemptive execution scheme if you start executing one task then you stop it and you execute another one that are, that's not a problem the, the, the model does not make any assumption on that um, so it doesn't care if you're running on a single or multi-core architecture and that will be particularly interesting for our topic today uh, the programming model of Asterius uh, follows the time triggered paradigm and okay there are basically two uh, two paradigms when it comes to real-time systems the time triggered paradigm and the event triggered paradigm and um, academic research and uh, decades of industrial applications have shown that time triggered paradigm uh, simply fits better uh, safety critical application both of the paradigms uh, offer some pros and some cons but when it comes to safetyness uh, the time triggered paradigm offers by design some good properties and in particular the site programming model because it is time triggered uh, we are able to offer a fully deterministic communication model and obviously that's a very important property but once again we'll uh, more on that in a few minutes so the time triggered paradigm uh, means that the key uh, concept of time triggered paradigm is that a task activation is only set by the current date, meaning that the only criteria to know if a task can be executed or not is uh, to know if the current date has passed, uh, if the start date of the task has passed or not. There is no way you can find with a time within a time triggered system you cannot have a task waiting for another task uh, or because it waits for a, for example for a lock to be released or for an IO device to be available that's simply not possible the only thing that a task waits for be before being able to be executed is it's what we call the release date of the task so once again, the Psi programming model is merely an abstraction and we build upon that, uh, we are going to build upon that a complete uh, tool suite that we call Asterios. Okay, let's dig a little deeper into this programming model. Uh, each task in the Psi programming model is a succession of what we call elementary actions or EA. An elementary action is, first of all, it's a set of instructions to be executed sequentially. And this set of instructions is expected to be executed within a temporal window that is bounded uh, respectively by the earliest start date or release date of the elementary action and the deadline of the elementary action. Uh, these dates, these formal dates, are called temporal synchronization points. And once again, the instructions of the EA are expected all to be all executed within this temporal window. The model here does not make any assumption on how or nor when these instructions are executed as long as they are all executed and they are all executed within this temporal window, meaning you can preempt the execution several times if you need to. That's not an issue, that's not a concern for our programming model. And one thing worth noticing here is that you need to make uh, we make a very strict distinction between the span of the elementary action that comes from a functional requirement and what we call the CPU budget. That's the actual computation time provided to the task, to the task, to the elementary action to execute all of its instructions. And let's take an example to illustrate the distinction between these these two times. Um, Consider you're writing a device driver that fetches uh, data from a sensor, let's say, and the data sheet of the, the data sheet of the sensor says that uh, new data is available every five milliseconds. Well, these five milliseconds will match the span of your elementary action. Every five milliseconds, you'll need to wake up and fetch the data from the sensor, run some instructions to fetch the data. If you switch to a new CPU that's twice faster than the previous one, the, sp the span of the elementary action will not change because your device will still only be able to produce one new sample every 5 milliseconds. The CPU budget, however, of your elementary action will most likely be divided by 2 because the instructions you need to execute to fetch the data can be executed twice faster since you are now running a, a CPU that, is, that runs twice faster. 
So once again, the span of the elementary action comes from a functional requirement and it is not supposed to change if you switch to a more powerful CPU. The CPU budget, however, is entirely target dependent and depends on how fast you are able to execute your instructions. Now at this point, usually there's always someone in the audience who needs to see some lines of code to fully understand uh, what we are doing and here goes. So this is, uh, in order to implement the, um, the, the, the Psi programming model, in order to enable a developer to actually write an application that follows the Psi programming model, we are offering a programming language called Psi-C. Uh, Psi-C is merely an extension of the C89 programming language. We've added a few keywords. And this is what it looks like. The first line, agent blinker, declares an agent. An agent is a task in Psi. Uh, so we declare a task called blinker. Within this task, we are declaring uh, what we call a body. A body is merely an infinite loop. Uh, this body is mandatory. It's called the starting body. And within this body, we call a function, an external function called switch on. And Okay, this call can be uh, an external function written in C or uh, uh, f an assembly function or anything really as long as it complies with the application binary interface. It's an external function that you can implement with any programming language that you want. And then comes uh, one of the most important keywords uh, in the PsyC programming language, that's advance. With this statement, advance1, the programmer is stating that the code that comes before this line, namely the call to switch on, needs to be executed within an elementary action of span 1. And then we have this line of comment, do nothing, that needs to be executed within an elementary action of span 4. So there is no code to be executed, but we have to wait for 4 units of time. And then we call another external function called switch off within an elementary action of span 1, followed by an elementary action, an empty elementary action of span 4. And okay, you've probably guessed what we've been doing here because, well, that's the dream of any embedded developer. We've managed to make a LED blink. Uh, it's periodic blinking every five milliseconds the LED switches on and off and one thing worth noticing is uh, with the Psi C programming language we are able to uh, handle the jitter of the switching on and off. We know that the LED will be on and off every five milliseconds and we know that it won't take more than one millisecond to switch on and off. One thing important here is that uh, We've declared uh, within the PsyC file, we've declared within the PsyC code, sorry, we've declared the span of elementary actions. We haven't declared the CPU budget required to actually execute these elementary actions. And the reason for this is that we use a separate file. We use a separate language to declare the CPU budgets. Once again, the reason behind this is that we want the programmer to make a strict semantic distinction between the width of the element, the, the span of the elementary action and the CPU budgets granted to execute uh, the code of these elementary actions. Now let's take a look at the PsyC development workflow. Uh, what happens when you want to write a PsyC application, real-time application? Well, you have to provide to write source code in the form of Psy, uh, Psy files, that's your Psy C code that describes your software architecture, the temporal behavior of your tasks. Uh, you also provide BGT files, that's the CPU budget allocation, the CPU budget, re CPU time required for each elementary actions that you have described in Psy C. And optionally, you may also provide user functional code that may be. Uh, C function or assembly function, that's typically the code for the switch on and switch off functions of the previous example. And okay, you will give all of this in, all of these files as input to our Psy compiler. And this compiler is a source-to-source -source compiler, meaning that we produce C source code from the Psy file and BGT files that you give as input. And we also generate some uh, assembly code, some target-dependent code, and all of these files are compiled by a CUTS C compiler. We have a backend, for example, for GCC, for Diab, and for other uh, CUTS compiler available on the market. And in the end, this will produce an application binary file that you will be able to load on the target hardware. 
as a matter of fact, you won't load it alone on the target hardware because um, in order to enforce the Psi programming model to ensure that all the good properties of the model are verified during execution, we also provide a real-time kernel called the Astorius RTK. And uh, it is loaded next to your application and it really runs the application for you on the final target. Talking about hardware targets, Astaius comes with a very specific target that we call the simulator. Basically what we have done is that we've changed the backend of the Psy compiler and we've used an x86c compiler. So the idea is that uh, the Psy compiler will now produce an executable file that is not meant to be executed with the RTK but is meant to be executed on top of the operating system of your typical workstation, so on Windows or on Linux. And that's what we call the simulation environment. And thanks to the Psy programming model, we are able to guarantee that in the sim within the simulation environment, the execution order of your task will remain unchanged. And most importantly, the data exchanged by your tasks in simulation will be exactly the same than those you will observe when running on the target hardware. And the feedback from our clients is very positive for the simulator and what they tell us is that 99% of the functional code can be debugged in a simulation environment on a typical workstation before switching to the target hardware. Basically, when you need to switch to the target hardware, the only thing you have to worry about is setting the CPU budgets right because you know that the functional and the temporal behavior of your application has been debugged previously in a simulation environment. So I won't go into the details here, but just to give you an idea of what the Asterius IDE looks like. Um, Asterius comes with an integrated development environment, and that's the main window. Actually, that's uh, the execution view. I've written the blinker example that we've seen earlier, and I run it through the simulator. And what you see here is the result of this execution. As you can see there, the uh, console output shows on and off, and that's just the result of calling the functions switch on and switch off. And what you see here is what we call the timeline. That's the temporal behavior of the agent blinker that we've written in PsiC. I am not running this on a hardware target, it's only simulation. And okay, the application that we've written, that blinker task is pretty simple, uh, needless to say, it's quite straightforward, but if you have something a little more complicated like this, here we have an application with two tasks, a sender and the receiver, well then you may observe in simulation, you may ensure, you may observe the data exchanged between the sender and the receiver, you may ensure that the data are exchanged in the right order, you may monitor afterwards uh, the uh, data that were exchanged between the sender and the receiver, and once again, even though you're doing this in a simulation environment, you have the guarantee, thanks to the Psi programming model, that the behavior will remain exactly the same once you switch to the hardware target. All you'll have to worry about is to set the right CPU budgets. So back to those issues that we initially wanted to address. The Psi programming model and its implementation, the Psi C programming language, uh, gives the developer a formal way to describe both its software architecture, that's the list of all of its tasks and the communication pattern between those tasks, and the temporal architecture, that's the temporal behavior of each of these tasks, that's what we've seen with typically with the advanced keyword. So this part is handled by the Psi C programming language. Now what about scheduling and communication? Well, let's start with scheduling. And basically, if I had to tell this in just one sentence, the idea is you don't have to worry, you don't have to care about scheduling, the Psy compiler will do it for you. For any application, the Psy C compiler produces what we call a repetitive sequence of frames, or RSF, and that's basically a static scheduling plan, the scheduling tables we've talked about earlier. 
and the idea is that because you've expressed you've described your application the architecture of your application your tasks and the temporal behavior of your tasks in a formal language in psi c the compiler is able to automatically produce a scheduling plan that will satisfy all the temporal requirements that you have expressed namely the span of your elementary actions and the cpu budgets for each of your elementary actions and well one plan is generated for each core every time you compile your application and uh, there are a lot of uh, benefits to, to this approach one of which is that because the scheduling plan is static it has a very low uh, online overhead the uh, Asterios RTK simply reads a table uh, to uh, schedule the tasks so it is executed in constant time and from a developer's standpoint that's really all there is to say about scheduling just click compile and the scheduling tables will be automatically generated for you if you need to change something in your software architecture or in your temple architecture say you need to add a task in your application or remove a task or change the span of an elementary action change the cpu budget just click compile again and the compiler will generate automatically a new scheduling new scheduling plan for you that's all there is to say you do not have to worry about scheduling anymore and that leaves, of course, communication, how to ensure data consistency and reproducibility. And once again, from a developer's standpoint, there is really nothing to do to enforce communication determinism because it is enforced automatically, both by the Psi programming model and at runtime by the Asterios RTK. Uh, we are able to guarantee that the observable input and outputs of each task will remain the same from one execution to another meaning if you take the, uh, the same application and run it say twice on the same hardware no matter the execution time variation no matter the hardware interferences that will occur we can guarantee that the data exchanged between the tasks will always remain the same the observable state of the systems will always be the same and that's also true when the scheduling plan changes for example if you remove a task or if you add a task obviously it will have consequences on the scheduling tables and maybe a task another ta another task that was here previously on the system will not be executed exactly at the same time but it won't have any consequence on the observable data that will be exchanged by this task with the rest of the system and how we do that is uh, we use what we call uh, the, the visibility principle it's a very simple thing that it can be an, it's we can enforce it thanks to the time triggered paradigm and unfortunately i don't have time to give you details on that but i'll give you further references if you're interested on that topic uh, the communication layer is implemented as a micro kernel service by the asterios rtk and it ensures at runtime both data consistency and the overall communication determinism and really um, we've done all the hard work for you if you need to go multicore the communication layer is lock free it's preemptible it's very efficient and it works transparently whether you're running on a single core or a multi-core architecture so typically you can write your application on a single core architecture and then uh, run it in, uh, on a multi-core architecture gunshot your tasks on several cores and the yet the observable data exchange between the tasks will remain the same and so that's it. We've addressed all four issues that we had identified earlier. And as you can see, software architecture and temporal architecture are addressed by the PsyC programming language that provides a formal way to describe your application, to describe it, both its functional and its temporal behavior. And secondary tasks, such as scheduling, secondary concerns actually, such as scheduling and communication determinism is enforced automatically for you by the, both the PsyC compiler and the Asterios RTK at runtime. At this point, you might be interested in uh, seeing how the RTK actually executes an application on the target hardware. And this figure shows the execution model. So the RTK binary file includes both the microkernel that implements the low level layers, the scheduling feature, the context switching, etc., etc., and the Psi communication service that we talked about earlier. 
So that's for the RTK binary file and the above comes the application binary file that was produced by the PSYC compiler. Of course, it includes uh, the code and data of each task, and it also includes what we call runtime data, and uh, that data includes the communication buffers. Because the PSYC compiler knows uh, the exact temporal behavior of each task, it is able to compute the optimal size of the communication for, for the communication buffers. Uh, so that's it. The goal of the RTK is to enforce strict both spatial isolation, memory isolation of each task, and uh, temporal isolation, thanks to the scheduling plan. Uh, the code of the agents is executed exclusively in user mode, whereas the code of the communication layer and the micro kernel runs in privileged mode. All right. That it is now time to get back to that position paper, CAST 32A, that we've talked about in introduction. So it was issued by certification authorities, and it points out the most sensitive issues that need to be addressed by an airborne system provider that seeks certification using an, uh, an, a multi-core platform. So I would like to focus on three main issues listed in that document and show you how they are addressed by the Astarius tool suite. Uh, the first item is MCP configuration identification. And through this item, the paper points out that the system provider is expected to clearly identify the tasks, their location and cause, uh, the shared resources they will use, etc. And he's also expected to show why the chosen configuration satisfies both the functional and the temporal requirements. Well, as we've seen, Astorius offers a formal, non-ambiguous way to fully specify that configuration through the PSYC language. And the tasks of verifying that functional performance and timing requirements are satisfied still remains to be done by the Astorius user, as, well, he's, after all, he, he, he's the one writing the requirements, but th these tasks are no longer correlated, meaning they can be performed independently. So, for instance, functional validation can be anticipated in a simulation environment, whereas uh, WCT, that's uh, worst case execution time valuation, can be performed afterwards as it will have no consequence on the observable behavior of the system and thus on the functional behavior that was previously tested. The second item listed in GAS 32A is the identification of interference channels. The system provider is expected to have fully identified all of the software software and hardware software interference channels that exist in the application and provide the mitigation means that he uses against them. With Asterios, the textbook software software interferences simply do not exist. They cannot occur in your application. Thanks to the time-triggered paradigm, there can be no interference caused by locks, semaphores or other software synchronization means. And one thing worth noticing here is that it remains also true in case of a software failure. Should for a task A, for example, fail in the system, the, the, the error management service of the RTK will only report the failing task A, a scenario where A would bring down, for instance, another task B because of a log held for too long, causing B to be reported as failing even before A is. That's simply not possible. Uh, the, the task that is guilty will be reported first, first, that is A. A faulty task, bottom line, a faulty task cannot overload a resource nor starve another task. As for hardware software interferences, unfortunately, there is no silver bullet here. They will still occur. You will still observe execution time variations because of cache effects or because of shared memory bursts, you name it. But uh, the programming model ensures that these interferences, as long as they remain within the ranges defined by the temporal requirements, and more specifically by the CPU budgets, WCT estimations, well, these uh, interferences will have no consequence. Uh, these variations will have no consequence on the system behavior and the data exchanged within the system. And once again, should an error occur, should, for instance, the CPU budget be underestimated causing a runtime error, the consequences will remain deterministic, accessible, as we've just stated before. 
third item listed in CAST 32A, and that's the last one I'd like to address, is validation and testing. Uh, the certification authorities strongly suggest that both data and control couplings should be extensively tested. And our answer to that is that with Asterios, uh, that testing is made easier precisely because data and control coupling is f are formally defined in PSI-C through the communication pattern, mainly. And besides, thanks to the principle of separation of concern that we've seen throughout this presentation, you know, software architecture versus temporal behavior versus scheduling and communication determinism, which are a separate topic that can be in addressed independently, we can guarantee that once you've tested the coupling for your application, you don't need to test it again should you change the CPU budget, the scheduling plan, or the core allocation. And if we take a step back on this problem of testability, because the hard because of the hardware design in itself, uh, asynchronous multicore systems have virtually an infinite number of possible states. So, and that's what makes them very difficult to test. Actually, perhaps someday formal methods will be used uh, in an industrial context to prove that a test campaign covers extensively all the possible states of a system. But uh, at the moment, to the best of, our, of my knowledge, at least, uh, this approach has not been used yet for a certified airborne system. And we do believe at Conosave that the time-triggered paradigm offers a viable alternative as it enables to make a partition of this set of possible states and uh, such to get a um, much more tractable subset of obse observable states. And thus it makes the testing operations tractable and most, most importantly it enables to perform these operations independently from the hardware architecture, be it single or multi-core. Before leaving, let me tell you a few words about our qualification strategy. We are currently qualifying our tools at the highest level of trust for airborne applications. That's DAL A, as defined by DO 178C. And here's how we do this. Uh, as you've seen, Astereos is really a set of tools and software. And one of the key components of Astereos is its real-time kernel, the RTK. And it is, it is embedded on the platform. It's running the actual real-time application. So there is no way around it really. This is airborne software. And Chronosafe provides, uh, provides a, a complete DAL A qualification kit for uh, the RTK. The PSI-C compiler, however, is a different story. That's not embedded software. It's also called the uh, Asterios Developer Code Generation Toolchain. And it produces a binary file that is meant to be embedded on the target hardware. So that's a tool that produces code that needs to be certified. And rather than, rather than qualifying the code generation tool itself, Conosave provides an automated qualified tool to perform verification activities on the binary file produced by the compiler, uh, thus satisfying dull A verification objectives automatically. And that tool is called Asterios Checker, and it is qualified at the level TQL5 in accordance with DO330, which is the companion document of DO178C on tool qualification. And basically, the, the, the tool covers DAL A certification credits for the code and data produced by the PSI-C compiler and embedded in the application binary. Uh, for example, typically the scheduling tables are verified by uh, Asterios Checker. As for functional tests, obviously they still need to be performed by the user, uh, but since, well, it's his code after all. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, please do not hesitate to come visit us, either on our website or in person. Uh, you'll find all the information you need to get in touch with us uh, here. And if you're interested in getting more details about the technology uh, behind Astoios, please do visit our website. You'll find various technology white papers, publications that will give you all the details that uh, I had to allude in this presentation, be it on communication determinism, scheduling, or the global engineering process with Asterios. 
Uh, if you're interested in technical details, I strongly encourage you to take a look at the blog posts that we've published. They focus on various topics and hopefully you'll find all the information you're looking for here. And uh, if not, once again, please uh, do get in touch with us. We'll be happy to share more details about our studies with you. So thanks again and uh, see you next time.